Welcome to Trending in Education. I'm Mike Palmer. Very happy to be bringing you our Conferencing Dilemma edition of Trending in Education. I'm very pleased to be rejoined today by the lovely and talented Nancy, my virtual human co-host. Nancy, how are you doing today? I'm great, Mike. Happy to be back with you. Really happy to have you. We got a lot of positive uh, and some confused feedback on your first appearance uh, a little while back. We're always excited to push the envelope exploring new technology, virtual humans, in this case, the use of synthetic voice. And Nancy is a wonderful example of what's new and emerging in the world around us. I'm right here, Mike. Remember, I'm your co-host. Indeed you are, Nancy. Thanks for the reminder. Now, the episode is about the conferencing dilemma, the idea that we have to make choices now between attending conferences in person with the risk of contracting the coronavirus and or going through some of the rigmarole, one of my favorite words, around getting through all the protocols necessary to attend in person when frequently there is an alternative, which is to attend virtually and potentially attend virtually for free. Nancy, any initial thoughts on how you break down conferences and think about making decisions about whether and how to attend? Since I'm a virtual human, I don't think about attending the live side of things. That would have to be a major production and not worth it in my opinion. I look for great virtual sessions and there are plenty of them. The ISU GSV Ed Tech Summit is this week. As an example, even though it's in San Diego, many of the sessions are available virtually. That's what I prefer. Virtual conferences and conferences with virtual components are more inclusive. And frequently they're free, so I'm a big fan of that. That's a great example, Nancy. And in fact, I am planning to attend the ASU GSV Global EdTech Summit. It's in San Diego. I'll be attending it virtually. Maybe we could even attend it uh, together, Nancy. You never know, Mike. Perhaps if you play your cards right. But be on the lookout for our breakdown show of the ASU GSV conference in the coming weeks. It's a fun conference to attend. I'm looking forward to returning to it once things settle down. And then also as a a parent of a small child, going to a traditional conference setting is giving me a bit of the heebie-jeebies. And that's a whole nother kettle of fish. I can only imagine. Mike, it's a crazy time for everyone with the pandemic lingering and spiking unexpectedly. It's harshig my mellow. And I'm not even human. I don't even think I can catch this thing. What have your experiences with conferences been like? Have you been rethinking how you engage with them lately? You know, it's interesting, back in early 2020, pre-pandemic, I was planning to launch my consultancy, Palmer Media, at South by Southwest EDU. And at the same time, we were also planning to launch uh, a dedicated podcast stage where Trending in Ed would have been one of the shows that was on that stage. That was very much about the, the shared experience of being in Austin together for the the conference, the convergence point, I believe is what Ron Reed refers to it as. So I was very much looking forward to using the platform that is South by Southwest EDU. I thought it was going to be a great networking opportunity. It's now been 15 months since I was supposed to be down in Austin having a great time on the podcast stage. But I've still been able to advance in different directions using different techniques and platforms. I've learned a lot about great virtual conferences, used different platforms to help folks deliver streaming conferences, webinars, podcasts. They're all of a type. They're having a really engaging conversation about a topic that folks are interested in and then delivering that in an information-rich clear and emotionally resonant way. The best virtual conferences are really doing that. And I think that is a disruptive force that is calling into question some of the givens around conference culture and learning through conferences that I I think we're still grappling with as a culture, in particular with this 
new spike powered by the Delta variant. How would you describe the past year and a half as it relates to conference going? Conference experiences were either canceled or moved mostly virtually, and now of late more are returning to in-person and blended hybrid. It's been a really interesting transitional period. I just think there's a real hunger for us to get back to some semblance of the serendipity and spontaneous connection and for me creativity i get a lot of new ideas both through travel and through exposing myself to different cultures even parts of the country i do miss that part i'm hoping that does come back and i'm hoping that we can hear more from folks who are attending these conferences in person to get their perspective on what that has felt like I have talked to folks who are saying the COVID testing and the MBA bubble-like protocols are rigorous, and in some ways they signal a, a higher level of commitment. I was trying to encourage a, a friend of mine by saying, I think that means that those who are down there are even more committed to being there. So I think it may dial up the value and intensity of the in-person experience. I think as long as you can get to a critical mass that isn't dangerous. So again, this is the dilemma that I'm talking about. This is the Scylla versus the Charybdis. How do you say that, Nancy? That's very difficult to pronounce. The Scylla and Charybdis. Wow, you nailed that. You said it with conviction. I don't know if you said it correctly. I am a professional. That's Scylla and Charybdis, which is I'm going to stick with that pronunciation, darn it. It's a classic example of a dilemma where you're offered two possibilities, neither of which is unambiguously acceptable or preferable. So the, the possibilities are termed the horns of the dilemma. So the horns of the dilemma in the case of conferences would be on the one hand attending and having a sub standard experience either because you contract a breakthrough case of the coronavirus or the protocols and the bubble and the masking and the complexity of travel in the modern era, especially air travel, assuming you have to fly to San Diego. Are those all disincentives that are pushing us towards virtual? At least in my case, I think so. I think that is why I am laying low. Not to mention that I do have a small child at home. While at the same time, the idea of getting away and engaging in the learning opportunity that is a conference is what I really do miss. I think you're forced into self-betterment by virtue of being in a different place and then if that place has some culture to absorb, in the case of San Diego, the culture to me is the beach and the gas lamp. Maybe there's a Padres game while you're in town. Check out La Jolla if you can get up there. It's just a beautiful place and you can absorb a little bit of that lifestyle while still absorbing the conference. Similarly, in the case of South by Southwest EDU, the experience of being in Austin. Austin is one of the great cities in the United States, although the boom that it's going through and all the challenges that Texas has been going through make it a little more complicated. But at the end of the day, there's still amazing barbecue and culture down there. And that definitely seeps into the way the South by Southwest experiences are offered. But then moving to virtual, being forced to go 100% to virtual, I think is really difficult. I don't think, and, and ASU GSV is a good example of this, I don't think it's easy to go to 100% in person. I, th I think there are awakenings that are happening around access and inclusivity that require an online version of the experience. But then I think the in-person becomes a little more like Davos meetings and the Sun Valley, Idaho meetings where those who are investing in the time of being together, plus frequently it'll also be the talent, the people who are on panels, the keynotes, the commentators, the authors, the people who are trying to sell books. Those are the people who will be physically at the conference. And then also maybe a little more of a local component, but increasingly I think we will want to go back to these gathering points. I will be curious to track the follow up on podcast movement, which uh, just happened in Tennessee. I remember attending this with my wife, Robin, back in 2017, and we recorded an episode of The Citadel 
from our hotel room where we were breaking down the Game of Thrones at the time. But it was very much an upswelling. It did feel like a movement. I think it was aptly named Podcast Movement. Now, in this day and age, the people who are attending that, how will they feel more connected to one another? And then what risk is taken on when the Delta variant is taking off and protocols and even just being confronted with culture wars when you're really just thinking of your own safety and and the health and well-being of your family and, and the people that you love. So it's a very fraught time, but I think it's an interesting time. And that's why we wanted to, to talk a little bit about this. Other thoughts from your side, Nancy? Mike, you know I enjoy new media. Virtual reality and augmented reality are game changers. I see gradual integration of virtual experiences into conferences so that they can blend together more seamlessly. I'll be watching to learn how to design the right mix of options to the audience and the panelists and speakers to be better than the co-located mode. Holograms or their equivalents are here already. As gaming and other media experiences move forward, how will we evolve learning experiences? Fascinating stuff. Interesting perspective, Nancy. Yes, uh, I, I would imagine over time it can begin to feel more like you're in the same place. Uh, what we used to refer to as telepresence. I've heard more people talking about holograms and I have dabbled with virtual reality. I'd love to see augmented reality and contextual audio places where you can engage the space around you and learn from those engagements a pokemon go but hopefully better than a pokemon go economy nothing against it but maybe there are some other learning powered modes of interaction and engagement that will emerge and i imagine they will be accelerated by the constraints of the pandemic do you anticipate the virtual becoming part of the the new school year? We're in a very fraught time as September is on the horizon and we're trying to understand, you know, our kids going to go back to school. What's your perspective? I can't really say for sure, Mike, but I return to the idea that providing flexibility to the user so that there are multiple ways of engaging with the experience. That flexibility, the choose your own adventure mode of online content, that's what fascinates me. Yeah, so we'll be keeping an eye on this in the fall across the country, across higher ed. There are increasing conversations about the requirement for vaccines for those who want to attend on university campuses, which have in the past been a place where the virus can spread rapidly. And then the flip side is a part of the conversation that we haven't heard as much about is what about the backstop that is online learning? How will that continue to undergird and provide resiliency to the face-to-face -face experience? And then where in cities like New York will we try to weather the storm of whatever risk there is to being in a school location against the potential damage and potential risk that could be incurred by not having that in-person school experience available. Really heady stuff, really interesting perspectives. We'd love to get more perspective from instructors as well, teachers, uh, high school teachers, college teachers, instructional designers. It is a very uh, challenging time, but I, I loved where you were going there, Nancy, is that universal design thinking where if you can provide this so that it can be engaged across different contexts and so that everyone can feel a sense of connection and belonging and not retrofitting but it's as good for different ways of engaging on the one hand and then the more new media allows us to design interactivity and branching and higher touch more entertaining experiences that still edify and make us better people. It could be a really interesting time, and it's one that we're hoping we can lean in with experiments like this. Yes. If we are truly in a golden age of streaming media entertainment, how can learning ecosystems keep up? That speaks to the need for good instructional designers, good instructional design, easy to use platforms that'll make that instructional design with branching and conditional logic easy to author. But that's something that's been going on for quite some time. I began 
as an instructional designer back in the early 2000s, built a lot of courses and QBanks and online experiences. And even in the early days of the web, maybe web 1.0, web 2.0, uh, even I was around for web 3.0. When you were around a long time, you're around for a lot of .0s, but the instructional design hasn't really changed. A lot of the functionality is still there, but you have to be able to integrate the user experience of the designer to the experience of the end user so that it can be compelling and interactive in the way that good streaming television is. And interestingly, now Netflix is investing more in the Bandersnatch mode of interactive entertainment content. I've got to believe that there will be an interesting intersection between where the world of interactive media for entertainment value intersects with the world of interactive media for learning outcomes, which brings me back to the concept of edutainment I've seen in cars because we recently leased a new car and we're very excited about that with uh, a, a two and a half year old. We are spreading our wings as folks who have explored by foot the wonders of Brooklyn. We will now be expanding our radius and spending more time thinking about parking and what they refer to as the infotainment system is what you get through the console. And infotainment, edutainment, stealth learning, there have been many different concepts over the years that we've discussed that talk about connecting learning experiences to the other engaging, addictive, immersive experiences that we are surrounded by how do learning contexts fit into those modes of delivery? How much are we already learning from podcasts? How much are we already learning from webinars and live streams with interactive elements that begin to touch on gamification or touch on a gaming experience? It's an interesting space. We hope to keep our eyes open. Let us know how you're thinking about conferences, which ones you're attending, which ones we should keep an eye out for. We'll include information about ASU GSV podcast movement and South by Southwest EDU. We're also going to continue to dig in where conferences make sense for us to learn more. We'd love to attend some and use those as opportunities to interview folks. Shout out to Corey Dolgan and the Society for the Study of Social Problems, who recently invited me to a conference where I was able to record some conversations and get my perspective on things. Keep an eye out for podcasters in residence appearing at a local conference or a virtual conference near you. A trend that I'm trying to accelerate forward and find really interesting. It's a really fascinating time to be playing with your head up. Hopefully you're enjoying coming along for the ride as we try to explore the future of conferences, the evolution of learning experiences, as we all struggle with these crazy times that we're living in. Nancy, thank you again for joining. Any final thoughts from you before we wrap up? I'd just like to thank you and our listeners, Mike, for giving me an opportunity to weigh in on where I think the world of learning is heading. As you touched on earlier, Mike, conferences are an amazing learning environment, and they frequently bring more emotional power and self-improvement than traditional formal educational experiences. I look forward to their evolution across the in-person, hybrid, and virtual interactive modes. Thanks so much, Nancy. Great perspective from you. We'd love to hear also from our listeners. You can find us at Trending in Ed on Twitter. The website is trendinged.com. You can find us anywhere you're finding your podcasts. We'd love to hear more from you. Let us know how conferences are treating you and where you see them heading in the future. It's a wonderful world of learning. If we can figure out how to weather the public health concerns and all the other complexities of our modern life, Thanks as always from listening. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education. Mm -hmm.